Today's episode of the Bitcoin Show is brought to you by Mt. Gox, M-T-G-O-X, Bitcoin Purchase and Sell for Currency, and MemoryDealers.com, MemoryDealers.com, and BitcoinBonus.com, and CableSaurus.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Bitcoin Show. We have a special treat for you today. This is Thursday, and now ever since last Thursday, we started a new thing called uh, Bitcoin, uh, well, we call it Thursday Panel Discussion. So we've got some uh, key people in the Bitcoin community to join us for a really cool conversation. And uh, if you have somebody that you'd like to see join our panel, be sure and send us an email to email at onlyonetv.com or Bitcoin at OnlyOneTV.com, specifically for this show. Um, but today, joining me um, live, well, first of all, here in the studio is uh, Yifu Guo, who is uh, uh, from BitcoinNavigator.com and also from OnlyOneTV. We're getting ready to launch a, a Mandarin, Chinese Mandarin language uh, Bitcoin show, and that Yifu is, is going to be the host. Yeah. Welcome, Yifu. All right, and thanks for having me. Also via Skype, we have uh, Stefan Thomas. Uh, hey guys. Probably everybody knows Stefan Thomas. We use coins. Dot, is it dot com? Yeah, dot com. We use coins. Dot com. Uh, you can use uh, dot com or dot org. It both works fine. Either way, he's got you covered. Okay. And bitcoinjs.org. Welcome, Stefan. All right, from hey. Swiss, uh, Switzerland, right? Yeah. Yeah. Switzerland. And uh, Gavin Andresen, everybody knows him. Gavin Andresen is the, the number one you know, tech lead for the Bitcoin project itself, bitcoin.org. People would recognize that. So, welcome, Gavin. Hey guys, good to talk to you. <laughs> Thanks for, for taking some time to, uh, to join us and have this little conversation um, because it's, it's just fun. And <laughs> so, um, so what's new? What do, what do you guys... I know uh, Stefan came up with uh, some uh, bullet points of things that are happening right now in, in the world of Bitcoin that are really interesting. Um, do you want to go through that and, um, and just see what's up with those things? Uh, yeah, I mean, the first thing that I wanted to hear about wasn't uh, something that, you know, I can talk very much about because I haven't been following it too closely, but uh, I would like to, to hear Gavin talk about the, the new client that's coming out, the 0.4. Um, I know that the second release candidate is out already, and uh, I think the main release is coming up, so I'd love to hear about that. Cool. Sure. Um, well, the big thing for the 0.4 release is private key encryption in your wallet. So that's the uh, big feature that Matt Corallo has been working on um, and it's gone through a lot of revisions. Finally, we think it's uh, nice and solid and, and ready to be released. So this is a feature where the private keys in your wallet that let you spend your Bitcoins are encrypted with a passphrase. And so unless you enter the passphrase, you can't send out those Bitcoins. Um, so that helps with uh, wallet security. It doesn't solve the wallet security problem but it, it kind of is a step along the path to getting really, really secure wallets. So you can actually, you can open the app, you can open your wallet, but you can't actually spend them until you enter the passcode, is that right? That's or? right, yeah, they stay encrypted until you go to send the Bitcoins, and then you can actually, you can, you can tell Bitcoin how long to keep them unencrypted. Oh, that's cool. um, and I that's actually cool. I forget how I forget what the default is, but you know if you're doing a lot of transactions, you don't want to have to enter your passphrase over and over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. So you can tell Bitcoin, you know, keep it unlocked for the next hour, um, mm -hmm. and then it will uh, keys get locked again. They're locked on disk, and they'll be uh, kind of locked in memory. Mm -hmm. And assuming that you don't have any you know bad programs running on your computer, looking at what keystrokes your your entering as you enter your passphrase, um, then that should be pretty safe. And you don't have to worry about, you know, somebody coming across an unencrypted version of your wallet that you backed up. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, when it's on disk and when it's backed up, the uh, private keys will be encrypted. Boy, that has got to be the number one most requested feature. And I, I love the fact that you, you're saying you don't need to enter the passcode and, until if and when you're ready to spend them. So you don't have to enter it constantly and have the chance of someone observing you entering it over your shoulder or every single time you enter it, it's another po potential point of uh, capture for some kind of a 
keyboard capture trojan, right? Exactly. Yeah. If you if you had to enter your passphrase every time you started a Bitcoin, you know, you'd mm-hmm. be entering it a whole bunch, and it'd be incon- it'd both be inconvenient and it'd also be less safe. So. Yeah. And it wouldn't really actually, uh, it's not even necessary. I guess, I guess you could have one just to prevent people from seeing your balance, but um, it's not as important. The most important thing is the spending ability, right? Right, yep. Okay. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't solve the, it doesn't really solve the, uh, you know, somebody will know my balance or somebody will, you know, be able to see all the transactions to me if they steal my wallet. You will mm-hmm. still be able to see that. So, I mean, you mm-hmm. still want to protect your wallet. Mm-hmm. Um, and you yeah. want to back it up, and all of those, all of those other things. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, this solves the kind of the most critical, the mm-hmm. critical issue. That's yeah, I, I can live with somebody knowing my balance as long as I can still keep it. As long as it's still there. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> when you go back to check it. So, what about um, backup? Is is uh, is the official client going to ever include anything that's going to do backup for you automatically? Um, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the next big release, the, the plan for the next big release is to switch the user interface toolkit that we're, we're using. So switch from WX widgets, which nobody seems to like, to mm. QT, which is a, a very popular, kind of the, the leading open source cross-platform right. uh, wow. toolkit. And John Smith has been doing a, a ton of fantastic work um, on the QT client. Um, actually, just earlier today, I was downloading it and was going to run it myself and review the code uh, to get ready for, for pulling that in uh, to replace WX. And I believe, I'm not sure, like I said, I've just pulled it in and am starting to review the code, um, but I believe that already has a uh, you know backup wallet menu entry. So I could be wrong about that. John but that's, Smith. That's, 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 that'll be the big thing for the next release. I haven't heard of John Smith. Is that his real name? <laughs> I have no idea. We don't really know. I, I should say it. I am not John Smith. I am not. I, am, <laughs> I know, we know. You're Satoshi. I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he really hates when I say that. Because all day long he's telling people, no, I'm not Satoshi. Stop asking me that. <laughs> so um, yep. that's, that's really fascinating. And uh, I, have a, I have a question. Sorry to interrupt. But um, yep. uh, is the DOS stuff that you're working on right now, is that going to be in 04? Or is that also for a later release? Uh, is which stuff that I'm working on? The denial of oh, service denial stuff of that we've been talking about? Um, the dial of service stuff um, probably won't be in 04, just because we don't have time to really thoroughly test it um, and review it. Mm. Um, and and really, I mean, you know, all of the d- denial of service. So, so we should probably back up and let the audience know. Sorry, uh, yeah, my fault. Yeah. Just yesterday, I think I submitted a pull request that just adds some kind of more makes Bitcoin a little more bulletproof to somebody trying to break it from the outside. Um, which is called, you know, denial of service, where you try to get Bitcoin to chew up a bunch of CPU time or chew up a bunch of disk space or, is that or the, whatever. Is that the um, unique uh, would, transaction, right? You're talking about that, that commit? Say again? The, the unique transaction, uh, right, to database. Is that the one? Uh, that fix, actually, that fix is in, in 04. That, that was a fix that broke uh, one of the alternate blockchains. Um, this is actually a, a different kind of more generic fix ah. uh, to try to be a little more proactive about if it looks like somebody's doing something weird, sending you information that that you you really you know don't expect or, or don't know how to deal with, then you drop their connection and you say, yeah. I don't want to talk to you. You're you're acting fishy kind mm, of thing. It's all, it's also so, um, somebody sort of makes you do extra work, right? And and you need to you need some way to punish them for that. So wow. they can't just, you know, keep you busy all day um, sending you bogus data and you want to sort of get rid of them if they do that. So that's kind of what that is about. How can you, how can you detect like every possible scenario that could lead to that? I mean, it's got to be challenging. Well, that, that is the trick. I mean, the, the, you know, kind of in other areas of security, there's these notion of blacklists and whitelists. Mm-hmm. And in general, um, blacklists don't work very well. Blacklist is where you, you try to, anticipate every possible bad thing that somebody will do to you and you say all of those things are banned Mm -hmm. Um, and that typically doesn't work very well a white list where you say you know these are all the good things that that I know about and we're only going to allow those good things uh, typically works better Mm, right right in my poll basically I'm saying you know if you start sending me bad stuff I don't care really what the bad stuff is 
then I'm just going to uh, start to ignore you. Or maybe a combination um, of both would work well. If you have, um, if you have a white list of things that are uh, always good, then those are allowed. But if any of these, uh, you know, whatever, a dozen obvious red flag things happen, then, you know, maybe a combination of both. Yeah, that's essentially what we're doing. So it, it's just kind of part of the, you know, my, my, my like I said at the uh, Bitcoin conference, you know, my, my primary goals are to keep Bitcoin stable and secure. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, new features are great, but they're really not what I've personally been, been concentrating on. So trying mm -hmm. to, you know, really beef up Security, security and trying to be more proactive about it instead of just always reacting to, to you know, the latest threat mm -hmm. to actually try to anticipate, you know, kind of whole ranges of threats is, is kind of what I'm, uh, what I've been working on recently. Right. The glitzy fun added features for usability can always be done by others too. The most important thing is the security and the scalability and safety of the thing, right? Yep. <laughs> Cool. Oh, that's actually, uh, if, if, you, uh, if you want, I can uh, sort of say something about Bitcoin Jest that ties right into that point, because over the last couple of days, I've talked to some developers who were approached me about Bitcoin Jest, uh, you know, sort of uh, from different perspectives. One was a sort of a payment processor. Uh, one person, uh, you, you might actually know him from uh, his, his GUI that he's uh, brought out, uh, Eli Sklar. Uh, he's come out with this very beautiful uh, Chrome OS, or, or sorry, Chrome uh, uh, app-based uh, uh, GUI for Bitcoin and uh, sort of the idea is that you know these GUIs could all use Bitcoin JS instead of the JSON RPC API and then people could um, could use them without having to install Bitcoin first right the, sort, of, sort of in the lightweight client mode and what that would allow me to do if, if one of these uh, developers actually jumps in and, and, and uh, takes over for example WebCoin or Bitcoin JS GUI um, I would focus on purely on the server side, so I would only work on on the Bitcoin, uh, sorry, the Node Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer server, mm -hmm. and other people would be working on the GUI for it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's the way to go, um, because as you say, you know, you need somebody who can worry about security and all that stuff um, full time. Right. As the, is the server side, um, is that open source as well, or is that yeah, that's yeah, part of the Bitcoin open source, yeah. JS package? It's all part of it. Oh, that's great. That's great. So anybody can run this server side um, service, right? Um, so over the last couple of weeks, uh, uh, some people have um, uh, sort of posted their experiences with trying to run it, and we're still ironing out sort so of the, the bug reports they come back with. Mm -hmm. um, somebody has just posted to the to the brand new Bitcoin Jazz mailing list um, a really nice guide on how to install it. So that's what I would point people towards. I'm going to post it on Bitcoin Jazz uh, on Twitter later. Um, so if you're interested in that, you know, definitely check out the mailing list, and then on there you'll find sort of a guide on how to install Bitcoin JS at the moment. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can run your own exit node. For, uh, the guys at TrueCoin um, are now running sort of a per permanent one. Um, uh, that's at exit.truecoin.com. Uh, I've heard from some guys in Canada who want to ru run a permanent one, and I'm definitely looking for people who are interested in also running a permanent exit node. So what an exit node is basically sort of the bridge between uh, these lightweight clients mm -hmm. and the Bitcoin network, right? Oh. So the peer-to-peer -peer network. Yeah. Nice. And uh, you need these bridges in order for the lightweight clients to connect. And uh, the more open bridges we can have, the better, because people can, uh, at some point, use two bridges and sort of compare the results that they give them back. And then if the results don't match, they know something's up, right? So if you have multiple exit nodes, you can actually um, get away with not trusting these exit nodes as much because you can compare the results to each other. Okay, so in um, let's see, anyone can so, oh, in the lightweight client. How is the exit node selected? Can you have more than one? Mm -hmm. um, uh, right now, uh, right now in WebCoin, it's just sort of an option that you can um, change in the settings. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the future, um, most client it's, it's up to the client developer basically what they do with it. So um, in the case of SafeBit, if they end up using Bitcoin Jazz uh, as the infrastructure. Um, then they would have to select like what is their default exit node or if it's multiple ones like what is their default policy in there. Um, I could see something like uh, if there are a lot of exit nodes like on some point some kind of name system that uh, like what Bitcoin uses some kind of uh, registry or something mm -hmm. um, where you can get a list of exit nodes or update your your pre um, uh, pre installed list of exit nodes uh, from time to time. So I could see something like that, but for now it's just a, a manual setting, and your client will likely come pre-configured with with some default exit node. And it, right now, is the um, the Bitcoin JS? Uh, the, you said it's a Chrome. Is it a Chrome add-on that I can get from my Chrome browser right now? 
Right. No, right now it's not for end users. So right now oh. I'm advertising sort of the infrastructure to people who want to build services. So if you're mm -hmm. uh, working on some kind of payment network or, or some, uh, you want some kind of good client for your customers for whatever Bitcoin business that you run, mm -hmm. um, that's when you should sort of talk to me and so I'll get you up to speed on, on what other people are working on, maybe put you in touch with them mm -hmm. and uh, that sort of thing. So for end users, you know, Keep stay tuned, I guess. Um, <laughs> so I think the the first really good client that's going to come out is if Safebit decides to use that as an infrastructure. So that's really the one I'm I'm most hopeful about. But there's other people also working who are who are really interested in in it. So I, again, I can't really predict where it's going to go. But uh, you know, the server is really stable now. So I've been running it since the conference, and it hasn't crashed. It hasn't had any problems. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know the service getting there uh, to be really really stable so i think the the clients are going to follow now okay so any lightweight client can use this backend right i mean a mobile mm -hmm. app or any it doesn't have to be a browser based it could be any lightweight right. client and, and as i said you know it's open source so obviously mm -hmm. we'd like you to stick to the standard mm -hmm. um, that sort of the same standard api so that you can use the exit nodes interchangeably but if you want to change something uh, you know you can do a pull request and we can maybe get it into the official client um, or you can just roll your own fork of it and, and run it any way you want. So, um, it's it, what, what it is is basically is, a, is an alternative to the original client um, for uh, specifically real-time applications where you sort of need real-time uh, data from uh, the Bit Bitcoin blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. And the exit node is just one example of that. And then you can uh, connect lightweight clients to that. Um, you could also use it uh, on the server side to do your own hosted wallet service or own payments solution or something like that. Um, again, it's like it's 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 really just a, a replacement for for Bitcoin D uh, for certain use cases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. So, uh, what's the status on Webcoin? I mean, we're really interested mm -hmm. in hearing about at the conference about when this new like like right method so of the, storing the, online the wallets. The on Webcoin is that somebody has uh, just posted bug reports, so that's not working on on Android. We dealt with that. Um, there needs to be a lot of restructuring in order to make it load faster. And also, um, we want to slowly get some people using it with very small amounts so that we can get some feedback on bugs and so on. Um, you have to understand that the original client has had like almost three years of, of uh, basically testing in, in a very real world setting. So it's really hard to actually catch up to that. Um, and I think that's that's sort of the goal right now. And I can't really say when uh, I would feel comfortable sort of letting my mom use it because again, you know, you have to iron out all the the kinks. And we, we're aiming, uh, I guess, a bit higher than some of the the, the clients that are out there already. So, um, right? Is there is know, there so like a test uh, test net installation somewhere that people could just like run tests on or? Or is it like a um, more? Because I remember test, I remember you before test it, when you were um, you can fire up your smartphone. And you can go to webcoin.ch. So that's just webcoin ah. and then dot ch. And is this uh, advertised anywhere? I don't think it's actually out. Like you didn't release this link, did you? Like I don't. Uh, it's know. online. Yeah, you can use it um, <laughs> on on smartphones. Uh, but on PCs, it won't work right now because the, the conversion is broken. And again, it's a work in progress. So I wouldn't right. really recommend any you know non technical people trying. Right. To use exactly. It right yeah, now. It's, it's not there. Mm -hmm. um, but in the future, you know, um, we'll definitely come on again, you know, report on the status, how things are going. Um, again, I'm, I'm focusing right now on the server side. So if you're interested in taking over the, the GUI, um, if you're a JavaScript developer or just generally a web developer and you're interested in, in the project, definitely let me know. It's a full open source project. There's no uh, special ties to anyone. Um, so, you know, if you want to contribute code or you want to take it over, even just let me know. Cool. Take it over. Yeah, <laughs> so the, you can go to webcoin.ch if you're a technical person for testing only. And right. that's actually live and working. Uh, and it's, it's not on the test net. It's on the actual Bitcoin network. Yeah, it's on the actual Bitcoin network. So, so you, you know, don't play with put you know, tiny you fractions of Bitcoin. Right. For God's sake, don't do that. Okay. Um, uh, cool. If you have any problems or you lose coins on it because of a bug or something, um, do contact me. But, you know... I can only help if, if the data is actually still there. So there's no money again, back guarantee. You know, use it at your own risk. So right. that's no. I can only only say you know, be careful. No money back guarantee from for testers. Okay. Right. <laughs> and the real. And a uh, quick thing before you take off on Bitcoin JS. I remember like before how like now the uh, Node.js 5.5 came out and it broke a lot of stuff. Like how easy is it for you for the the to deploy at the moment? Right. Um, right. So the different components have different um, requirements right now. 
Um, so Bitcoin peer-to-peer, -peer, sort of the main, sort of the, the, the thing that's a quasi-replacement quasi, quasi, quasi for Bitcoin D, um, that's pretty easy to install at this point. You just uh, run, uh, you install Node, you install NPM, and then you install one library, and that's all described on, on the website. Um, you install one library, and then you install, you run one command for installing the software. And from there, you have a nice little command line utility. Um, I'm going to make some videos uh, probably over the next couple of weeks um, to explain how it works and sort of sh uh, walk you through the, the installation procedure. Yeah, Until DAO then, or Wiki or something. If you want to try it out, um, um, check nice. out the mailing list again. So somebody's posted a really nice article on how to do that. Yeah, that would um, be perfect. Right. So yeah, so there's a couple ways. As for the other components, most of those you have to install them straight from GitHub. So you know that's definitely for advanced people only. So if you want, you want to run your own exit node, um, you can go to GitHub. Again, you know the guy who's written this article has included those. So um, if, that gives you a little bit of a guide. But um, yeah, that's definitely for for advanced Node.js developers only. Cool, cool. This is but this is getting really really interesting. But this is a good time. I got to take a break really quick and thank our sponsors because without them we wouldn't be here. Um, so we thank Mount Gox. Um, MTGOX, Mt. Gox, everyone knows the, uh, the number one Bitcoin exchange site. You can uh, buy and sell Bitcoins for, I think it's like 16 currencies now, natively right within the site. And um, they're enormous. They're you know, one of the longest institutions in Bitcoin and um, they're here to stay. They have something like 90% market share at this time. And um, we, uh, they're consistently supporting the Bitcoin show in all of our languages as we launch them. And so we, we thank them. We're very grateful to Mt. Gox for uh, continuing uh, to sponsor the Bitcoin show. And MemoryDealers.com. MemoryDealers.com uh, is a site that sells all sorts of networking and memory and um, all kinds of uh, high-end networking hardware. And they, uh, Roger Ver was here at the conference. Many of us met him, and a really, really cool guy who's coincidentally, totally coincidentally, uh, just is lives like a few blocks away from Mount Gox in Tokyo. Bizarre, it's just kind of bizarre, actually. They get together for lunch sometimes. Um, in fact, you'll see that when we when we finally do release all of our video that we shot in Tokyo, you'll see um, really, really cool uh, footage that we took there. But anyway. MemoryDealers.com. Roger Ver is a huge Bitcoin evangelist, uh, if you don't know him. And uh, so one of the things that he's doing now is launching a 10% rebate in Bitcoin. So for all of his customers, not just Bitcoin customers, but every customer of uh, MemoryDealers.com, you make a purchase. It doesn't matter if you're in a corporate environment or whatever the deal is. You make a purchase through a you know, MasterCard, Visa, credit card, PayPal, or even a purchase order, and you will get 10% back in Bitcoin. So um, all you have to do is at the checkout put the code BTC2011, BTC2011, and you'll get 10% back in Bitcoin. So uh, check out bit, uh, MemoryDealers.com and thank them for supporting us. And BitcoinBonus.com, similar kind of deal for shopping anywhere else online, wherever you are on uh, Buy.com or uh, pretty much every site online that you're going to purchase something at. Make sure you go to BitcoinBonus.com because you will be, I'll be surprised if it's not listed there. They have hundreds and hundreds of online merchants there. So the stuff that you're going to buy anyway, just go to BitcoinBonus.com first, get the link, click it, and then you will get a... Uh, a rebate in Bitcoin. So BitcoinBonus.com, we thank them for their support. And CableSaurus.com. CableSaurus, it's C-A-B-L-E-S-A-U-R-U-S, -E like dinosaurs, I guess, or something. <laughs> CableSaurus.com uh, is uh, uh, your, your source for uh, cables and all sorts of peripherals, but they specialize mining, in cables. Right. And mining rigs and too, right? Yeah. Just okay. mining, mining stuff in general, they have CPUs, and I believe they have video cards. They have expanded since their initial launch. Oh, okay. So they yeah. have all sorts of things. All right, even more than I knew. And uh, they accept Bitcoin, of course. They're, they're uh, Bitcoin merchants. So we thank them for their support as well. All right, so back to the good stuff. The t as, this is all good stuff. But uh, tell us more, tell us more. <coughs> what else yeah, is Well, uh, talking about, you know, maybe not good stuff, uh, we did want to talk about the price a little bit. So I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts on that? On which? On the price of Bitcoin right now. Oh, the price of Bitcoin. Oh, what do you think? Well, the price... I, I noticed that it went down. <laughs> it went down, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what I noticed I that. I noticed that, too. Um, you know, did you notice that the user numbers were pretty much constant throughout, though? The user like, the number numbers. of nodes? Uh, I didn't actually notice that, but that is interesting. Um, so I thought I it was know, kind you know, I used to work in I used to work in Silicon Valley for a publicly traded company. And after working there for a couple of years, I just stopped 
paying attention to stock prices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good There way seem to be no, no, no relationship reason. between what's actually going on and this, the, the price. It seems like there's lots of speculation and fear and kind of irrational exuberance and maybe some rational exuberance sometimes, but, you know, I don't know. That's, that's been kind of my attitude towards the Bitcoin price is that it'll work itself out in the long run. I think we need, uh, we need a and, public, uh, a community committee to plan for the irrational exuberance because <laughs> there has to be an algorithm that can predict this. <laughs> yeah, right? can ask like, ben Bernanke might be jobless pretty soon. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean? Know, he's got oh, a, I see what you're saying. He's yeah, got he, experience with with trying to, you know, yes, manage uh, complex systems. And we'll stuff. ask him to submit his resume. His resume is <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh! True, true, true. No, I, I think he might he might find a job somewhere, but uh, <laughs> he knows some, some friends might take him in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just so unpredictable. I mean, you can people uh, always try to pin it to some current event. Well, this. Uh, media story must have had that effect and so on. I mean, yeah. you can. I mean, if, if you look at the if you look at the charts, the only real event that you can pin the decline to is the incredible rise. You know, so yeah. I think most bubbles is kind of weird. It's like most bubbles sort of grow slowly over many years. If you look at dot com, if you look at the housing growth, like this stuff that grows over a long, long period of time, and then in in like in these crashes like Black Friday and whatever it's called. You know, the, these uh, uh, the, the price goes back down, right? Mm -hmm. With Bitcoin, it's kind of been the opposite. It's like this: on on a few days, it goes up to you know thirty thirty dollars, and then there's like this uh, the steady decline over the next couple of months. So yeah. it's kind of it's kind of an inverse bubble, and I think it might actually be an inverse bubble in in in, in a very sort of tangible sense. Like in a normal bubble, everybody thinks it's crap. Uh, sorry, everybody thinks it's great, and then suddenly they realize it's crap. With Bitcoin, everybody realizes it's great. But now they're sort of like wondering, like, how long is this going to take to actually take off? You know, what are the actual implications? Is it maybe not the right cryptocurrency? So, like, this, it's sort of everybody was like at this party, and now everybody's sort of wondering. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but what 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 really I, li I liked about the um, the right or the, the at least the steady maybe rising um, user numbers is, you know, what that means is that it's money moving out of speculation and into actual usage of the currency, right? Right. And that is so much more important. Like all the speculation, yeah. that's noise. Like that's not even interesting. But you know, yeah. people using it is so much more important. And yeah. also, what I noticed is that people understand it better. I don't know if you've noticed that, but people understand it better now. They're starting um, to. Yeah. There's more people developing for it. There's more people talking about it, like in a sensible fashion. So right. I don't know. I think it's it's mm -hmm. good uh, good signs all around. It's just that you know, prices is, is adjusting back down to a level from you know a huge rise before. I mean. I remember when, when it was at four dollars, and everybody thought that was a gigantic rise. That's when yeah. uh, this guy Neil Dio made his uh, video, "Don't buy Bitcoins." That was yeah. when Bitcoins was at four dollars. You know, it was a tremendous so bubble. Yeah, we're still quite a bit higher than that. So well, that's I don't know, the thing. Kind of you know, the public's memory is about two and a half weeks. That's all. They don't remember anything more than two and a half weeks, apparently. Right. Because the thing is, if you look at any investment, <clears throat> okay, I'm just saying, okay. Nine months ago, it was five cents. Now it's five dollars. That's a right. fact. It's a hundred times its value in nine months. That's just a fact. So you know, it, but people only remember about two and a half weeks ago. You know, like well, it was you know whatever. Or the the last high, it was they three dollars. Remember, now they it's always five. Always remember the good days. Yeah, I mean, yeah Essentially, yeah. but it's it's good if you look at like a logarithmic like uh, historic chart on the Bitcoin. It's kind of like it's going up. And then it kind of plateaus off a little bit. It's like it's trying to find its price, and then mm. maybe it goes up again, and then it plateaus off, and then it trying to find its price. Like overall, it's it's still increasing, as you know. Mm. You said it's over nine months, it's five cents, fifty cents to like five dollars. And mm. I think I think overall, like it's still going well. And and obviously the most important thing is Stefan said is is about user base. And the cool thing is like I've been trying to strike up like Bitcoin conversation in, in just to anybody I talk to really that has like a random chit chat. And more and more people are being aware of what it is, even if they don't know how it works. Like, mm -hmm. like it's definitely seeping from the virtual world into our physical world, which is like nice. And and that they'll be like, oh yeah, I heard about bitcoins. And then and mm -hmm. then you know you get on with this conversation. So it's not just some like thing that only exists online or people trade it for speculation currency. And that that has been increasingly the surprising factor to me when I talk to people in like just the people I meet on on like you know the streets or whatever. And I. Mm -hmm whatever conversation comes up.
Yeah. And, and that's been that's been really like rewarding. And be like, have you heard about Bitcoin? They're like, yeah, you know. And, and then it's just like, wow, really? Yeah. It's really yeah. helpful when you're talking to somebody and they've already heard of it because then you, right. it leads right into the conversation. There's two two real quick points I want to make. One is when you're talking about the value of Bitcoin, the number, the the really to me the meaningful number is uh, connect the dots. <clears throat> if you look at the the historic value of Bitcoin and you take the lows. You take the absolute lows and connect those dots and make a line. It's still this logarithmic rise. It's a very clear yeah. rise. So if you ignore all the peaks and that's just think of that as the static in between the stations, and you just connect the dots of the lows, the lows, the lows, the lows. It's a very steady, very yeah, steady, about, predictable think about high. The, the drop from from one point one, where was it one point one dollars, and then it had this slow decline down to about I don't know fifty seventy five cents or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe a bit lower. I don't remember, but it, it had this slow decline, and that was right before sort of the main media hype sh uh, started, right? And then the right. price went through the roof. But it was this this it's it reminds me of exactly what's going on now. There's this sort of this slow decline. Mm -hmm. It's like slowly going down. And now it's sort of waiting to mm. reach a broader audience. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think what, what could happen is that some more user-friendly clients come out and then suddenly it reaches a whole mm -hmm. group of people that they just couldn't reach Boom. before. And uh, that's kind of what I'm waiting for. And I think it's going to just keep you know, stagnating or tapering off slowly until we hit that point where you know, somebody comes up with, with a more user-friendly solution and then we can bring in a whole group of people who weren't, be able, weren't able to use it before. That's right. I see that. So, are you buying or selling, Stefan? Um, well, I said uh, publicly <laughs> before that I was going to sell until it went back down to four dollars, and that was <laughs> when when it's I think at twelve or something. So, um, wow. You know, I'm still I'm still waiting for the sort of for that floor of, of about four dollars. Probably not. I don't think it will quite reach it. Maybe it'll break through. I don't know. Um, if it breaks through four dollars, I don't think it'll stop until you know two or three or even one dollar. Wow. So. Um, I think it's it's going to go somewhere to above four dollars and it's going to rise again. But I can't give investment advice, so um, <laughs> I'm selling. Right I, would, now, I would be. So. I, I'm holding right now. I would say uh, I have been selling, but I think I'm holding now, and Oof. I'm just going to wait and maybe buy when it goes a bit lower. Maybe this little bit of information will influence you. Um, I it's already public now because I put it on my Google groups. I have a Google groups called Bitcoin People. And uh, I put it out there, and then somebody uh, posted a blog about it and already tweeted it all over, so it's all over. But um, I, I can't say who quite yet, but soon you'll find out. Um, I got contacted the day before yesterday by a major restaurant chain that has hundreds and hundreds of locations all over the country. And they sent, he, he actually sent me an email and said that I was uh, and so inspired by your show that that is why we are going to be accepting Bitcoin. So he's, like, he's so psyched about it. And in fact, he said, by the end of this weekend, they, their IT people are going to are talking with me and stuff, and they're going to actually uh, be installing Bitcoin, some sort of a point of sale method to accept Bitcoins in three of their restaurants as a test by the end of this weekend. And they're planning to roll it out, assuming everything goes okay. They're going to roll it out to all of their locations, and they're very very clear um, that this is uh, cutting edge and uh, it will get much better. You know, in a, in a number of months or maybe even weeks. They'll have a much better solution solutions available to them. But uh, anyway, they're really excited about it. I know. This, so I know if you've huge. been. Uh, I know you've been contacted by Brian Cohen. He's one of the developers who was interested in Bitcoin JS because he was working on a point of sale. Mm -hmm. So you know, he's one of the people who might be supplying the technology for that for the restaurant, or maybe Andrew Schaff. So um, there's definitely people out there working on this right. stuff. So I, I'm sure they find find a good solution. Definitely, I know. I know them, and so yeah. Be, if you have, if you're working on a Bitcoin point of sale system, let me know because um, I want to be aware. Well, first of all, I want to be aware of everything that's going on anyway, and uh, possibly have you on the show and stuff. But also, I can you know help field it for the for these guys. I don't want to publish who it is quite at this very moment because they're going to get a flood of 150 people. And since they contacted me, I you know want to give them the uh, you know the honor of giving them my opinion first, and then after that, I mean, I'll have them on as a guest on the show, and I'm sure they'll be bombarded with people from then on <laughs> selling them but but you know a lot of the point of sale systems are uh, are ideal for a small mom and pop shop but it's a whole different ball game to have something that will scale to you know hundreds and hundreds to 500 retail locations that's that's a whole nother game yeah effectively you know what I mean and they really has sort of has to integrate into what they're already doing or else it, it does it's not gonna make sense for a, on a grand scale yeah, like that I think that kind of thing really is the key to kind of Bitcoin's long-term 
value and success. And, mm-hmm. and I would just, you know, listening to this conversation, it strikes me that maybe one statistic we should start keeping track of is the, the volume of Bitcoins going through the exchanges versus the volume of Bitcoins just being exchanged on the Bitcoin network. Because that should give us a sense for, you know, kind of how often people are turning around and going outside the Bitcoin economy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that might be a really good statistic. We should probably start keeping track of. Why? Why? You, they, ideally, you'd like to see you know lots of lots of bitcoins sloshing around, person to person, and you know every once in a while maybe you have to buy something with dollars, so you have to go to an exchange. <laughs> but you know, ideally, you want it all in the bitcoin economy, right? Why did it take us that long to think of that, Gavin? <laughs> no, I mean, I think there's, a there's a comparison chart really? like, relatively out already. There was, like there's there about maybe of, fifty to one hundred fifty transactions per block in fluctuation wise and the current exchange is you're doing about like 20,000 bitcoins a day so i mean people What's the difference yeah. the difference between them is the is, is the commerce yeah so okay. effectively like an exchange is doing like 20,000 bitcoins and this is i mean because date there's a lot of day trading related stuff so you can't really use that as a, as a you know granular mar- measurement tool but mm-hmm. but you could totally just look at the block and be like how many transactions is in this block and and we're looking at maybe 50 to 150 per 10 minutes and that's really like less than what we should be expecting we like, should do that we should have like bitcoin charts or something should prominently have a well there's figure. there's yeah. on on bitcoin watch there is uh, the number of how many bitcoins were transferred i think in the last 24 hours Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I actually it's kind of funny because I actually looked at that uh, not too long ago when uh, Paul Krugman wrote his piece on his blog about Bitcoin and uh, I wanted to respond in the comments because one of the things he said was that people are just hoarding Bitcoins and uh, I thought it was that was uh, ridiculous because because Bitcoins are so easy to transfer so um, <laughs> it's actually you know, like even if you wanted to hold more Bitcoins you could just you know spend the ones you have and just buy more like there's no yeah. rational reason why you would just hoard your bitcoins and like not do anything with them. The, the, the price is a market price. So if, if for some reason you think they're worth more, just buy more. So you know I, I, I don't I don't understand that argument at all. So in order to debunk it, I wanted to sort of compare the velocity of money of the U.S. dollar with the velocity of money in Bitcoin, and that's really difficult to do because Bitcoin has um, it actually transfers not just the, tra- the the money you send, but also the change, right? It, it sends a change back to yourself. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of really difficult to actually distinguish those two things. And um, so, but I've been thinking about that. So we really need some kind of um, institution or organization or group of people or something, some website um, where, where we can track some economic data for Bitcoin because, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the, the Federal Reserve has that. We need something like that as well. We need some way to... to, to something that supplies data also for arguments for talks for all this kind of stuff so definitely I, I'm, I'm with you 100 percent yeah the idea of hoarding something i mean it's almost like saying you know people are receiving emails and hoarding them you know not sending them on it's all about the utility the more email it, uh, uh you know transactions happen it's because people are getting utility out of the function of email the same for bitcoin mm-hmm. the more transactions are happening the more utility people are getting out of it the more benefit and commerce is happening for whatever it is so that is a great great number we should be watching for sure is the uh, the amount of transactions minus what's happening on the exchanges i mean it's obviously some of that might actually be you know uh cash sales person to person but um but a lot of it is commerce actual commerce mm-hmm. that's happening that, and that is the utility of it. That is one of the, I mean, obviously investment is great, but um, the utility of using it is a great number to measure. Another thing I've, I've come back to or looked at again was the Bitcoin stock exchange, right? GL, GLBSE. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's something like back then I was sort of like, yeah, this is kind of a funny idea, but I don't think that's going to be important for a while. But, you know, now I think it's getting to the point where, where this, should get some more prominence. And one of the things I'd like to see it would be uh, an index for that, right? Like a, a Bitcoin stock market index. And then we can start sort of seeing, like over the entirety of all the, the stocks that are traded on there, sort of see um, how does that develop? How does, how does the Bitcoin economy develop? Because that's kind of a, such an important indicator for you know, the, the classical economies, the, the stock market price, right? So why don't we have that? Why don't we have an index where we can see um, okay, the Bitcoin price is going down, but how are Bitcoin companies doing? Are they making profits or are they making losses? So that's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, I've got to be honest. The, yeah. the, the, the GLBSE scares the pants off of me for no particularly good reason. It just, 
it makes me start to squirm with, uh, you know, I know how heavily regulated stock markets are, mm. and it just, it, it, it scares me. It, it, it makes me think that maybe, you know, it would bring uh, more attention from potential regulators or even just, you know, all the trust issues with, I'm sure there's going to be a GLBSE company that raises a bunch of Bitcoins in stock and then just up and disappears. Um, mm. You know, you can, that's, mm-hmm. that's got to happen, right? Sure. <laughs> I mean, with all the other bad things that have happened, it seems like that's inevitable. So yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, hmm. I, I don't have any, you know, really, really solid reasons to say it shouldn't be done. And I certainly, you know, can't control it. And maybe it will be a huge and wonderful success in, in you know, free market stock exchanges. And I hope mm-hmm. so. But I just got to say it, it, it scares me. What an experiment. Right. Can it but regulate I, 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 itself? I got to agree that, that, that that's going to happen, that you know, some, somebody's going to raise money through that stock exchange and disappear. But I also think that you know, there's now people in the Bitcoin community that you know, you know that people you've seen, um, people who've been either on this show or on other uh, uh, public platforms surrounding Bitcoin, maybe people you've met. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm getting at least to the point where there's some people in whose companies I would be willing to invest. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, present company not excluded. So you know, so there's there's some people, uh, and there's so many more too. And at the Bitcoin conference, you could meet so many people. So I think, mm-hmm. um, yes, it's 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 still risky, and you should be aware of the risk. But you know, all investment is. So, you know, I'm not saying go yeah, well, and not, buy I'm any random worried. any random Bitcoin stock. Just you know, buy one where you really can believe in it. Yeah, but I'm also worried about you know the people who actually own the companies who I do know who maybe aren't aware that they're violating securities laws or, you know, doing, I'm not an expert in any of that stuff. I just know enough about it to know that I'm I'm worried. It could be, (laughs) it could be like having, you know, I don't know, just like uh, having a sandbox filled with sugar at the park, you know, in a picnic because it's going to attract the ants. I mean, if you have, it could be bait for regulators to come in. Is, Is that what you're saying, Gavin? That it could, it could be just, you know, regulator bait. Because if, if, especially if somebody does pull a scam like that, and uh, that will be the justification of why it needs to be regulated. Right. Mm. Yeah. I mean that that's that's a big part of my worry. Is is yeah. It it might attract unwanted attention. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't well, know if it if it if it could be worse than having a, a currency. Like to me, like a currency is something that's far more regulated than even stock markets. But I, I might be wrong. I don't know. But. Mm. Um, well, I it's don't like banks. Share that word that's necessarily worse than what we already have to worry it's about. It's kind of like the e-wallets that there's a, you know there's 20 new e-wallets springing up every week and there's nobody regulating them. They don't even have a contact tab, you know. <laughs> it's like who are these people? Any 10-year-old can set up a bank now. So, uh, right, that, mean, that worries me too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's like crazy <laughs> craziness too. I there's one of them I talked to for an hour and before I really I wasn't getting it and finally he explained to me no, no, no. We're a Bitcoin bank, but we don't have online banking. What? Oh, you, oh, we'll email you an address that you send the Bitcoins to. I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding. And they're literally calling themselves bank, the word bank in their name. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, it's just, it's nuts. But that's the thing. It's kind of the wild, wild west. And anybody can set up a bank. Anybody can set up a stock exchange. Of course, you want to invest with people that you know and trust and you know, that's like, I guess, age-old wisdom, but boy, it really hits home when you're dealing with an electronic cash, irreversible transactions and all that. It, um, so the, uh, the idea of the stock exchange... Oh, here's another thing, Stefan, is that um, if... Not, obviously, that might be a good indicator of how Bitcoin businesses, some Bitcoin businesses are doing, but uh, of course, not all Bitcoin businesses are on that stock exchange. Probably most of them are not. Mm. Right, so it'd be harder to measure the. There, there are probably very some very successful Bitcoin businesses that are not going to be on that stock exchange, right? Yeah, okay, but that's true for all stock exchanges. For example, SAS Institute is one of the largest software companies, or well, they make statistical software. I'm writing a case study for for my study program right now, mm-hmm. and uh, they're not on a stock exchange either. So um, you know, even with with the Nasdaq or whatever, those are just sort of a random selection of the, yeah. the companies that are actually gone public. Yeah. Um, so that's that's true for any stock exchange. So that's not exclusive to this. True, true. It's a little bit. Um, uh, it's a, it's a small sampling of Bitcoin businesses, and uh, and it might yeah. not even be a fair sampling because it's big, it's startups that have sought out funding by using that method. They may be less mainstream. I don't know. 
That's just a hunch. Uh, I don't know. Like again, like it, it depends on where the stock exchange is going to evolve evolve into. I mean, as long as we're talking about you know a few dollars, uh, you know, I don't think regulation is something that that really we need to worry about on on the stock exchange side. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's going to in the long run, it's going to depend on how big is it going to get, and the bigger it gets, the more it has to comply with with more and more regulations. Uh, it also depends on where is it located. You know, because it's it's Bitcoin, it could be located anywhere. So. Mm -hmm. um, Again, I, I don't know if the operators of GLBSE are necessarily the right people to um, to meet these challenges, but I think that uh, a stock exchange for Bitcoin uh, is both necessary and very, very interesting. Yeah. There could potentially be multiple stock exchanges, obviously. Right. For sure, yeah. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Okay. What else is on your list of topics that you, uh, that you came up with, Stefan? Um, I don't know. I don't remember. Ah, yeah, oh, right, the the congressional hearing. But that's really more of a small mansion. I don't know right. if anybody's seen that. Yeah, I have the paper. Yeah. I mean, they also published like whatever they were talking about, and and um, it was it, like Lawrence Al White, was it? Uh, Lawrence White, yeah. Yeah, Lawrence. He's a White he's an Austrian school economist. Um, so I think just to give the backstory, right? So there was this congressional hearing in in Ron Paul's committee. I don't remember what's called the banking committee or something. And one of the the witnesses he called was Dr. Lawrence Wright from George Mason University, and he argued against legal tender laws. And he wants they they're pushing a bill for um, uh, you know liberal uh, liberal how is it called in English? <laughs> you know, um, a more liberal market for. For, for money, right? So that mm -hmm. you can have competing currencies. One of the mm -hmm. things that Nobel Prize winning economist um, Friedrich von Hayek um, actually pushed, or Friedrich A. Hayek pushed. And um, so this guy was arguing for it. And so he, uh, he listed a whole bunch of different things that people might want to tie their contracts to the, or denominate their contracts in. Um, things like, you know, commodity baskets. And, and he had a really long list. And then uh, when he got to pretty much close to the end, uh, he suddenly said Bitcoin. And it was kind of a weird moment because he said it so like normally, like this would be just something that you might want to denominate your contracts in, you know. So um, I think that's interesting, and and uh, it's a nice mention. It's it's all I thought about it. Gold, gold, silver, gold, silver, gold, gold, Bitcoin. Whoa, where did that come <laughs> from? Right, <laughs> it was kind of. I mean, wow. all is really heavily focused on like m like pre uh, precious metal based currencies, though. But I think if it gets passed, we'll we'll see something interesting because it abolishes. Like the side of uh, what is legal tender and what what is like, can you print your own currency? It will like remove that wall, which would be nice. Yeah, interesting. Let's see how. See yeah, how speaking of goes. speaking of units of account, it's another interesting subject. I mean, with the Bitcoin price being fairly volatile, um, sometimes you you might want a different unit of account. So I think a lot of stores are already um, sort of putting dollar prices and then uh, you know accepting bitcoins for them. Right. Uh, a lot of payment interfaces are sort of trying to. Um, isolate the, both the customers and the merchants from uh, exchange rate risk uh, in terms of Bitcoin. So, you know, th that's a really interesting question because do you want to use the dollar as um, a unit of account? Because the dollar itself is not necessarily uh, super stable anymore. So, um, it's kind of interesting uh, what could you use as a unit of account if Bitcoin um, goes up too much or is too volatile and the dollar goes down too much. So, why, what can you actually use as, as a good. Right way to price your products in the future. So I think I the know. Economist likes to use the uh, the Big Mac. They have their Big Mac index. Oh, no, which is really? The price of Big Mac right. across the world. So right. maybe you could uh, well, somehow tie the price of a Big Mac. Where you can pull that from. Uh, is it true yeah, they have a $30 Big Mac in Tokyo or something? No, I was looking for it. It's not that, actually, it's not that crazy. I was in Tokyo recently, you know, and the like prices six, are not... It's like 6 $7, I recall. Yeah, right? I mean, it's about the same as London. I mean, it's like, it's about the same as Manhattan, really. It's not mm. that, that crazy expensive. I think that the yen actually has been stronger yeah, to the dollar. Right, yen has been really strong recently. So, That's probably why. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, to go back on the, you know, the whole, how people are spending and, and to do to bouncing between currency risk and putting prices in dollars from merchants. And to go back to, do, to the whole like transparency of the network, like I think a lot of the spending, whether to be on exchange or, or commerce or things, aren't being seen because it's, it's done through a third party system as opposed to over mm -hmm. the Bitcoin network. So like half the stuff are going to like maybe like three addresses owned by like a merchant processor, you know, rather than people just sending Bitcoins across the network. And I think a lot of that it's currently not being registered because we're, we're still looking at maybe sub 200 transactions per block. And, and, and in reality, I think we're look, it's, it's a lot more than that. 
and and we're just not seeing it because it's being swallowed up by by an exchange or by some kind of like merchant solution mm -hmm. and and i think that that it doesn't have to change but i think as more people become more aware of and and as second generation technology come for for these you know people who are less uh technical they could use they could still use the network and i think i think that's the more of the key is to get merchants to actually physically use the, the bitcoin network to do their you know commerce related stuff as opposed to do it through a third party solution even though that's great and all and and and, and of course there will be less fees because you're not doing it through a third party of a third party you know because peer-to-peer is supposed to be like a low fee and but if you were going to do it through somebody else who was going to talk to this large peer sworn and and then they're taking you know whatever fee and that's that's not really the intent of the bitcoin system mm -hmm. well as long as they as long as they main compatibility right so as long as you can pay with them to through another process right so as long as they do that you maintain competition as long as you main com competition you know you maintain the advantages of bitcoin so i think it's one of the most difficult questions to answer whether it's going to be third party services or whether it's going to be sort of peer to peer type solutions I think both is possible, and it's really hard to predict which is going to be the one that we go with, uh, or people people choose. Um, but I think it's going to be an improvement over what we have now in both cases, because in both cases there's more competition. When uh, Ifu well, makes I one good point, though, when you're talking about Gavin's number for measuring commerce, when you have, for example, if somebody's using a Mt. Gox uh, point of sale uh, solution, and the transactions coming from a Mt. Gox customer to a Mt. Gox customer is an instantaneous transfer and all that, that is not going to be measured anywhere. It's well, you need something. You need something like Bitcoin charts, right? So you need to go to Mt. Gox and you need to say, "Give us that data in an aggregate form, right? So that you know it's anonymized <laughs> and you can't see who yeah. sends what to who." Yeah. Um, but you want sort of the totals, and then you can create something like Bitcoin charts where all the data is sort of presented in a nice form. Yeah, as long as everybody wants to play well, you know, with each oh, other, right. and as long send as well that people data. Want to provide the data. <laughs> well, why are they doing it on on Bitcoin charts, right? Why are they they putting out their you know volume, right. for example? Like they don't, they wouldn't have to do that. Yeah. Um, I think I think they are willing to do that as long as it's in an accurate, anonymized form, because maybe they want to know themselves how they how they stack up. Maybe yeah. I don't know. Like I, I I actually don't understand why people are putting all that data on Bitcoin charts, but it's definitely possible to get it. Maybe you pay for it even. I don't know. I think it's probably. I mean, my guess is that. Um, they don't want to be the only one that's not there. It's about you know if if you're an exchange and you're not there, you're like why are not why am I not there? You know, right, you're, right, it's like sure. the cr standard yeah. of credibility. Yeah, and if all the data is there, but your number is missing, they're going to you. Why is your number missing? Because the community wants to measure that and compare. So. Yeah, I mean, I get I get emails from from uh, you know wallet providers like uh, there was the uh, Iranian company, the Canadian company, like just writing to me. Um, you know, we want to be listed on, on We Use Coins, and I think you could tie that to something like that. Why not? I mean, um, right now, that's actually a bit, pretty good question. Maybe uh, I can get some in, uh, insight into that. Like, what should we list on We Use Coins in terms of wallet providers? Because I'm really, uh, how's it called, a, a burnt child? Like, somebody who doesn't, like, I, I've really got burnt with, with featuring my Bitcoin, obviously. So I'm really hesitant yeah. to feature other yeah. wallet providers. What, Me what, what, too. Do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, exactly. I my, I just I don't even want to. I think you should wait until any. you're. Yeah, I don't. Right. I mean, the best way is not to feature any. But I think it's it's better to provide like alternative client that's based off like your your null JS or Bitcoin JS when it's more fully like oriented, ready for testing. Because yeah. that's that's more or less third party dependent than than you know all right. the other stuff that needs to be done. Yeah. So I think that the, the, the whole thing is like minimal trust, right? Like we don't want to trust anybody. But even even JavaScript, you know, encryption client side has its problems. But even though they're much less than you blindly giving somebody your money, mm -hmm. but there's still risk. And I think people have to understand that before blindly just going to your website and be like, oh, they, they recommended this thing and this yeah. website is nice. Let me use it. You know, that's essentially what you has happened and, and we don't want to do that. Yeah, if you link to 150 wallets, uh, e-wallet sites, I mean, it's almost like this implicit uh, recommendation and I, I won't right. do that anymore. <laughs> Been there, done that, got burned. I'm not going to do that anymore. So there's two questions. Is what Obviously, the future clients that are coming that will secure your wallet and all that, obviously, that's the best solution. But um, that's not here today. So they right. need a solution today also. So there's a two parts to that answer. Well, you have to have something on there today or nothing. Say, just don't do it. Where it's, not, it's not ready. Or come up with something that you can recommend right now. And that's tricky. 
um, you know, it's just really tricky. It's a, it's a strategic move. What would you recommend to your mother, you know? And, and then the right. second thing is, you know, obviously in the future, these, and even then, you don't necessarily want to recommend a third party. If, if there's an application that's open source that will back it up for them and do everything the right way, like the, the ones that you guys are working right, on exactly. now, then that's what you'll recommend, right. of course. You won't recommend a third party. Even system. then, I wouldn't, especially then, I wouldn't recommend right. an e-wallet. You know? Right. But, but there is a place for e-wallets. Not to say that there isn't a place for e-wallets. There is a place for some you know, pocket change that you want to go out uh, to a restaurant or whatever. And you, just for convenience sake, you know, there is. Um, you know, we, we, I, went, I ran into this a little story. I ran into this in uh, Tokyo because we went to tape at this Japanese nightclub uh, that has agreed to accept Bitcoin. And you'll see it on future episodes. All the, all the footage of that is really fun. And, uh, but anyway, they've agreed, there, there are actually four nightclubs that agreed to accept Bitcoin. So we shot the whole thing of us setting them up to accept Bitcoin, which is kind of hysterical. But anyway, in, in advance, Roger said, you know, let's use, uh, he wanted to use InstaWallet. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 I don't like that. I don't, I don't like recommending InstaWallet because there's no login and password. It just makes me really nervous that a URL yeah. is, it, people don't understand, especially a, a novice user doesn't understand that a URL is your password. What? You know, it's just, to me, that's, that really something bothers me about that and so right. I said you know just use uh, you know whatever uh, can't use Mt. Gox because he's got a YubiKey whatever whatever different things so I was like well try uh, you know vBanco and so we set up a vBanco it's real super super simple but I mean it's so simple it doesn't even have a transaction history log I mean it's, it's almost like insta wallet with a password so we're like okay we tried that well apparently there was some kind of a glitch they, they say it was a, a bug in Bitcoin D or something like that, that the account, we sent 100 Bitcoins to it and it didn't get posted for like 15 hours. It was still not posted and they had to actually go in and manually post it. So there's some kind of a bug. But that's the problem, you know, you, I mean, you, you've got issues. Yet, yeah. yeah, and he's like, see, see, we should have stayed stuck with InstaWallet, you know, <laughs> with the green addresses and stuff. Ah, what are you going to do? It, there's always something. But well, I, I Insta think there is something, InstaWallet is something I want to, address directly because I believe it's it's currently featured on on we use coins so mm -hmm. you know obviously it's not something where you want to keep huge amounts for sure like definitely but yeah you should play um, it is the most convenient I'm thing sure right now and I, I, I um, I've co had a lot of correspondence with the with the operator and you know he's a nice guy and he's used his real name so mm -hmm. you know it's it's a step up from my Bitcoin for sure, oh, yeah. um, but it's, but there's still this lingering fear, obviously, and and you know people might watch this video in the future after InstaWallet has been hacked or something, so you know <laughs> uh, it's going to be really funny. But you know it's the only service that I I can see that I want to at all recommend because as you say you need to recommend something. You can't something just you say trust. there's nothing right now. Yeah, I know it's something, and I, it's not that I don't trust the guy or the service or the, even the technology. It's just the the principle of not having a password just really bothers me. Right. But, uh, but yeah, so there so there's a there will be a place for for e wallets, but. I think the ultimate thing is what you guys are working on, these new clients that just secure you from beginning to end. Because you're talking about, like, we're not just talking about a browser cookie. We're talking about money here, you know? And it's like any amount of money is important. It has value. And, you know, we're, we're, we have to be good stewards of our money. And now, I'm sorry, I, I hate it, but I have to cut us off because we're out of time. We're, we've literally well, <laughs> got, like, 60 seconds left. So we have to do this again, you know, same well, time Gavin gets week. the last word, I would, th I would say. Okay, don't give you guys the last word. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I have nothing to say. I have nothing more to say. Well, <laughs> How about you, Gavin? <laughs> <laughs> I guess my last word would be, uh, if you do use an online wallet service, don't put any money there that you can't afford to lose. Yeah, right. That would be my, uh, my last word. Amen. Hallelujah. That's right. <laughs> what about you, Yifu? <laughs> you got a last word? Um... No, well, I'm I'm just I'm just waiting for like you know because right now most of the service that came out it's more like business related. It's all trying to monetize everything, and I think the open source is just you know a step behind. And when they get here, and a lot more things that that has just simply goodwill, like you know here's Bitcoin JS that's just want to do open stuff. Yeah, and I think those those are coming, and and brighter days are to come. And I think second generation will be here soon. Okay, thanks. That's it. We're out of time. But uh, join us again tomorrow. And uh, every Thursday, we're going to do this pa community panel discussion, and it's uh, fun. It's so cool. Always something to talk about. But thanks for joining us on The Bitcoin Show. See you tomorrow.
Today's episode of the Bitcoin Show is brought to you by Mt. Gox, M-T-G-O-X, Bitcoin Purchase and Sell for Currency, and MemoryDealers.com, MemoryDealers.com, and BitcoinBonus.com, and CableSaurus.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Bitcoin Show. We have a special treat for you today. This is Thursday, and now ever since last Thursday, we started a new thing called uh, Bitcoin, uh, well, we call it Thursday Panel Discussion. So we've got some uh, key people in the Bitcoin community to join us for a really cool conversation. And uh, if you have somebody that you'd like to see join our panel, be sure and send us an email to email at onlyonetv.com or Bitcoin at OnlyOneTV.com, specifically for this show. Um, But today, joining me um, live, well, first of all, here in the studio is uh, Yifu Guo, who is uh, uh, from BitcoinNavigator.com and also from OnlyOneTV. We're getting ready to launch a a Mandarin, Chinese Mandarin language uh, Bitcoin show. And Yifu is going to be the host. Welcome, Yifu. And thanks for having me. Also via Skype, we have uh, Stefan Thomas. Uh, hey guys. Probably everybody knows Stefan Thomas. We use coins. Dot, is it dot com? Yeah, dot com. We use coins. Dot com. Uh, you can use uh, dot com or dot org. It both works fine. Either way, he's got you covered. Okay. And bitcoinjs.org. Welcome, Stefan. All right, from hey. S- Swiss, uh, Switzerland, right? Yeah. Yeah. Switzerland. And uh, Gavin Andresen, everybody knows him. Gavin Andresen is the, the number one you know, tech lead for the Bitcoin project itself, bitcoin.org. People would recognize that. So, welcome, Gavin. Hey guys, good to talk to you. And you say, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to, you, you're, you're acting fishy kind of mm. thing. It's, al- it's also so, um, somebody sort of makes you do extra work, right? And, and you, need to, you need somebody to punish them for that. So wow. they can't just, you know, keep you busy all day um, sending you bogus data and you want to sort of get rid of them if they do that. So that's kind of what that is about. How can you, how can you detect like every possible scenario that could lead to that? I mean, it's got to be challenging. Well, that, that is the trick. I mean, the, the, you know, kind of in other areas of security, there's these notion of blacklists and whitelists. Mm-hmm. And in general, um, blacklists don't work very well. Blacklist is where you, you try to anticipate every possible bad thing that somebody will do to you, and you say, all of those things are banned. Mm-hmm. Um, and that typically doesn't work very well. A whitelist where you say, you know, these are all the good things that, that I know about, and we're only going to allow those good things uh, typically works better. Mm, right, so, right. In my okay. poll, basically, I'm saying, you know, if you start sending me bad stuff, I don't care really what the bad stuff is, um, then I'm just going to uh, start to ignore you. Or maybe a combination um, of both would work well. If you have, um, if you have a white list of things that are uh, always good, then those are allowed. But if any of these, uh, you know, whatever, a dozen obvious red flag things happen, then, you know, maybe a combination of both. Yeah, that's essentially what we're doing. So it, it's just kind of part of the, you know, my, my, my like I said at the uh, Bitcoin conference, you know, my, my primary goals are to keep Bitcoin stable and secure. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, new features are great, but they're really not what I've personally been, been concentrating on. So trying mm-hmm. to, you know, really beef up security, security and trying to be more proactive about it instead of just always reacting to, to you know, the latest threat. Mm-hmm. To actually try to anticipate, you know, kind of whole ranges of threats is is kind of what I'm uh, what I've been working on recently. Right, the glitzy, fun added features for usability can always be done by others too. The most important thing is the security and the scalability and safety of the thing, right? Yep. <laughs> cool. Are but there any actually, other? Uh, if, if you looking at what keystrokes you're you're entering as you enter your passphrase, um, then that should be pretty safe. And you don't have to worry about, you know, somebody coming across an unencrypted version of your wallet that you backed up. Mm-hmm. Um, again, you know, when it's on disk and when it's backed up, the uh, private keys will be encrypted. Boy, that has got to be the number one most requested feature. And I, I love the fact that you, you're saying you don't need to enter the passcode and, until, if and when you're ready to spend them. So you don't have to enter it constantly and have the chance of someone observing you entering it over your shoulder or Every single time you enter it, it's another po- potential point of uh, capture for some kind of a 
keyboard capture trojan, right? Exactly. Yeah. If you if you had to enter your passphrase every time you started a Bitcoin, you know, you'd mm -hmm. be entering it a whole bunch, and it'd be it'd both be inconvenient and it'd also be less safe. So. Yeah. And it wouldn't really actually, uh, it's not even necessary. I guess, I guess you could have one just to prevent people from seeing your balance, but um, it's not as important. The most important thing is the spending ability, right? Right, yep. Okay. Yeah, it, do it doesn't solve the, it doesn't really solve the, uh, you know, somebody will know my balance or somebody will, you know, be able to see all the transactions to me if they steal my wallet. You will mm -hmm. still be able to see that. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you still want to protect your wallet. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. you want to back it up, and all of those, all of those other things. Um, but you know, this solves the kind of the most critical, the mm -hmm. critical issue. That's yeah, I, I can live with somebody knowing my balance as long as I can still keep it. As long as it's still there. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> when you go back to check it. So, what about um, backup? Is is uh, is the official client going to ever include anything that's going to do backup for you automatically? Um, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the next big release, the, the plan for the next big release is to switch the user interface toolkit that we're, we're using. So switch from WX widgets, which nobody seems to like, to mm -hmm. QT, which is a, a very popular, kind of the, the leading open source cross-platform right. uh, wow. toolkit. And John Smith has been doing a, a ton of fantastic work um, on the QT client. Um, actually, just earlier today, I was downloading it and was going to run it myself and review the code uh, to get ready for, for pulling that in uh, to replace WX. And I believe, I'm not sure, like I said, I've just pulled it in and am starting to review the code, um, but I believe that already has a uh, you know, backup wallet menu entry. So I could be wrong about that. John but that's, Smith. That's, 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 that'll be the big thing for the next release. I haven't heard of John Smith. Is that his real name? <laughs> I have no idea. We don't really know. I, I should say it. I am not John Smith. I am not. I, am, <laughs> I know, we know, you're Satoshi. I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he really hates when I say that. Because all day long he's telling people, no, I'm not Satoshi. Stop asking me that. <laughs> so, um, yep. that's, that's really fascinating. And uh, I, have a, I have a question, sorry to interrupt, but um, yep. uh, is the DOS stuff that you're working on right now, is that going to be in 04 or is that also for a later release? Uh, is which stuff that I'm working on? The denial of oh, service the denial stuff of that service. we talking about? Um, the dial of service stuff um, probably won't be in 04, just because we don't have time to really thoroughly test it um, and review it. Mm. Um, and and really, I mean, you know, all of the d denial of service. So, so we should probably back up and let the audience know. Sorry, uh, yeah, my fault. Yeah. Just yesterday, I think I submitted a pull request that just adds some kind of more makes Bitcoin a little more bulletproof to somebody trying to break it from the outside. Um, which is called, you know, denial of service, where you try to get Bitcoin to chew up a bunch of CPU time or chew up a bunch of disk space or, is that or the, whatever. Is that the unique um, uh, transaction, right? You're talking about that, that commit? Say again? The, the unique transaction, uh, right, to database. Is that the one? Uh, that fix, actually, that fix is in, in 04. That, that was a fix that broke uh, one of the alternate blockchains. Um, this is actually a, a different kind of more generic fix nah. uh, to try to be a little more proactive about if it looks like somebody's doing something weird, sending you information that that you you really you know don't expect or, or don't know how to deal with, then you drop their connection. <laughs> Thanks for for taking some time to uh, to join us and have this little conversation um, because it's it's just fun and <laughs> so. Um, so what's new? What do, what do you guys, I know uh, Stefan came up with uh, some uh, bullet points of things that are happening right now in, in the world of Bitcoin that are really interesting. Um, do you want to go through that and, um, and just see what's up with those things? Uh, yeah, I mean, the first thing that I wanted to hear about wasn't uh, something that, you know, I can talk very much about because I haven't been following it too closely, but uh, I would like to, to hear Gavin talk about the, the new client that's coming out, the 0.4. Um, I know that the second release candidate is out already, and uh, uh, I think the main release is coming up, so I'd love to hear about that. Cool. Sure. Um, well, the big thing for the 0.4 release is private key encryption in your wallet. So that's the uh, big feature that Matt Corallo has been working on, um, and it's gone through a lot of revisions. Finally, we think it's uh, 
nice and solid and, and ready to be released. So this is a feature where the private keys in your wallet that let you spend your bitcoins are encrypted with a passphrase. And so unless you enter the passphrase, you can't send out those bitcoins. Um, so that helps with uh, wallet security. It doesn't solve the wallet security problem, but it, it kind of is a step along the path to getting really, really secure wallets. So you can actually, you can open the app, you can open your wallet, but you can't actually spend them until you enter the passcode. Is that right? That's or? right. Yeah, they stay encrypted until you go to send the Bitcoins. And then you can actually, you can, you can tell Bitcoin how long to keep them unencrypted. Oh, that's cool. Um, and I, that's actually, cool. I, forget how, I forget what the default is. But, you know, if you're doing a lot of transactions, you don't want to have to enter your passphrase over and over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. So you can tell Bitcoin, you know, keep it unlocked for the next hour, um, mm -hmm. and then it will, uh, the keys get locked again, they're locked on disk, and they'll be uh, kind of locked in memory. Mm -hmm. And assuming that you don't have any, you know, bad programs running on your computer, 